BBC Radio Derby. Nearly quarter past twelve, though. Time for a bit of lunchtime conversation. Lunch with today, Jody Bunting. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Ian. Uh, Jody, who you might have seen on God, Big Breakfast, you were on for a, a long while, weren't you? That's it. Back in the day, or, or you might have encountered uh, in many of your, you know, fitness and weight loss courses that you've been involved in over the years. You were you on Lorraine at some point as well? Yes, on ITV. TV. It turns out you worked in Egypt for a while. You know the weirdest thing? The thing that people remember me most from yeah. is Trisha. I don't know why, but was that is Trisha. Fat Sexy? Yeah, that's it. <laughs> is Fat Sexy, my show was called. When you were, I'm sure you won't mind me saying, what, 30 odd stone? Yeah, 31 stone, and I kind of pranced in and did this massive kick. So I think kind of that was a memorable moment for a lot of people. When you look at back at that time in your life, are you proud or do you wince a bit? Because I was so big and so confident, I th I'm actually proud of that because I know now so many bigger people who, you know, don't even leave the house. So for me to be so confident when I was so big, I, I am proud of that moment, actually. It's a difficult one, isn't it? Because you, you need to be at ease with who you are, but equally, you know, you've lost more than half your body weight. Yes, I know. Again, looking back, I, I find it really hard to relate and believe. People say this when they've lost weight. They feel like a different person, and I really do. And I'm, I'm trying to... I was just you literally using my fingers in the dying moments of that song to try and work out when I first met you. 20-something years ago, I think. Yeah, I think 2001, 2002. So, yeah, 20 years ago. Crikey. Well, it's good to see you. He's brought, he's brought lunch as well. I, did, I, I, I went through a, a roller coaster of emotions in the space of one sentence. Ian, I brought lunch with me. Healthy lunch. <laughs> it, it is called lunch with, isn't it? So I thought we'd just have now a fun day. No, Some people bring donuts. You brought frittata and hummus and carrots. And <laughs> avocado. Yeah, I'm not a fan of an avocado. <laughs> the rest of it, bless you. Thank you ever so much. Thank you for coming in. Um, so I said you were from Hatton. I, you're never far from Nestle, of course, in, in Hatton. You, your mum worked? worked? Yeah, my mum and dad both worked there when um, I was younger. So I'm used to the constant smell of coffee. Uh, coffee. Yeah. And, it, and you still live in Hatton? Yes, I'm still there now. It's not a bad part of the world, is it? No, it's amazing. Again, when I've been travelling and stuff, when I come back just to go walk down by the river there, it's amazing. The best, And for lockdown, it was fantastic. I literally discovered all new paths around my local area. We, we send out these, these questions and answers before you come in and do one of these. And I'm struck by, you know, we, we chuck it in there very often. There's nothing worth picking up on. But what's one of your earliest memories? One, I can relate and identify, and two, it's so vivid, and, and I want to ask, eating so many Smarties that the colouring would drool out of the side of my mouth. So, basically, my mum and dad used to go to the stuff shop, and they used to bring home bags of kind of crush sweets and things like that, and there used to be these white bags full of Smarties, literally a kilo of Smarties, <laughs> and I remember picking up the bag and just pouring them into <laughs> my mouth, and I could hardly chew, and I remember the colours coming out the edges of my mouth. <laughs> See, that could be just a lovely, adorable childhood memory, or I might be overthinking it, but does that already speak volumes about your relationship with food? It said, but I loved it. I loved being a kid and I just love food, which is, again, a kind of the thing that I relate so much to my slimmers now is because I do love food. You know, whether it's a social occasion, whether it's at home cooking, whatever it is, I do have that passion for food and really enjoy it. You know, a lot of people in it have eating disorders where actually hate food and can't stand it. So I don't necessarily think it's a really bad thing. Uh, but you are right. Right from the beginning, food was kind of the centre of my life. But that ties in with the, the goodies that you brought in, I guess, that, you know, if you want to live a healthy life, you can still love food. It doesn't need to be a, a problematic thing in your life. Absolutely. And it's one of those things where you have to learn with, to live with it. So, again, going for natural foods, local foods and really enjoying your meals. I think that's the, the secret to success. Do you ever wake up and think, I want to be lazy today? Because to maintain the lifestyle that you have and the, and the career that you have now, I mean, you're doing park runs every weekend and you're instructing water fitness, aqua fitness and, you know, weight loss. And, and do, you, do you ever wake up and think, oh, do you, I just want to slob out on the sofa today? I do try and have a Sunday as my day off where I completely do nothing. Sometimes we go to Carsington for a little walk, but I try and have Sunday as my offline off uh, eating healthily, off exercise. So I think, it, again, it's also healthy to do that, you know, to have a complete break. Whatever you do, stop doing it and do nothing for a day. Um, so you did uh, catering and hotel management at college. 
Yes, High Peak College in Buxton. With a view to doing what with life at that point? Well, I mean, who knows when they're that young, but we think we do. I don't know, were you a fat kid or not? I, yeah, I've always been chubbier, I guess. So, yeah. in my experience, every careers advisor at school tells all the fat kids <laughs> you need to be a chef. So, I ended up getting... I like to think it's improved <laughs> since those days, but I know what I mean. Let's hope so, yeah. So, I ended up going to um, Buxton College doing a, a... It was a general catering course, actually. We did a little bit of housekeeping, a little bit of restaurant management, and also in the kitchen as well, which was great fun. Um, again, my greatest memory from Buxton uh, College, they had like a, a student shop. So, all the stuff that we, we were trained to make they sold it dead cheap and i remember going back to my hall's residence with a tray of vanilla slices oh it was just heaven <laughs> and i went on then to do uh, restaurant management that's what i kind of after okay. you did the general course yeah, yeah. you could then um kind of move on to a speciality so restaurant management is my official training but i have got mvq level one in how to clean a toilet are you impressed ian well yeah, it's better than i'm as, as could be demonstrated but let's not people off their dinner um <laughs> you 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 say you've taught fitness classes from what 16 years old yes so i was going to a slimming club as a teenager my mum was trying to promote me to lose weight how hey. overweight were you as a teenager my weight went with my age. So when I was six, I was six stone. When I was 13, I was 13 stone. So that was kind of the, yeah, yeah. the graph. That's how it and went it kept up. Going. And at a slimming club, a fitness instructor came in, was talking about the benefits of exercise. So I went along and I knew from that very first fitness class I went to, it was a step class in Etwall, and I knew I wanted to do this as a job. It was just so much fun. The music was on loud. Everyone was happy and smiling, sweating, but smiling. And I just knew I wanted to do this. So I, I've got quite a big family. My mum's got seven sisters and four brothers. So as a family, we're kind of huge. So Automatically, I had my own fitness class ready to go. We hired out the local school, Hatton Heathfields Primary School, and I just taught fitness. It was kind of a little bit of a trial and error at the beginning because I'd never taught before. Mm -hmm. I'd attended loads of classes, and then when I got to 18 years old, that's when I qualified as a fitness instructor. So that was my start in the fitness world. I know it's a bit of a leap from that point to, to when you're doing things like the big breakfast, but... How does it work in your head when you started to carve out this niche for yourself as if you like the fat fitness guy? And, and you probably don't want to be that shape, but it's, it's working for you professionally. It was, yeah, it was strange. I have to thank Derby City Council because they were the one that gave me my big break with this because one of my friends that I went on the fitness training course with, uh, she was working for Derby City Council and their exercise department had a brainwave to do a fitness class in one of the local community centres in Alice Street for just overweight people. So men had to be size 38 38 inch waist or more and ladies had to be size 16 plus so it was exclusive for the overweight and because the uh, fitness instructor that I did my training course with from the council knew me she knew that I'd be a great instructor for this class um, and I don't know whether you know the story then but that Alistair class then got in the Derby Telegraph and then ended up in the National Press and that's how I got my job on the Big Breakfast. So again it's all down to networking and you know just being friendly with people that's what I've learned in life you know the, the more people you can smile at and actually get a connection with the, the better off you're going to do in life. What was your favourite thing about that time on the Big Breakfast because that that, that's sort of a chapter in British TV history isn't it? I think the best thing was that um, within media, I've done quite a lot of early morning shows and everybody's kind of deflated. But me and my dancers used to go in there, like we've got our dance routines, we've got our music ready, and we were just like the fire to the engine. It was just salts. <laughs> <laughs> it was just so great, just being the energy. And they'd have breakfast before the show, they'd have breakfast after the show. It was just, as you could probably tell, it was quite a social show and it was just fun to be on. Let's play some music, chat some more. Jody Bunting doing lunch with us this afternoon. I like pink. BBC Radio Derby. My guest for lunch with today is Jody Bunting from Hatton. You like the colour pink, don't you? You do a lot of pink related. I love a bit of bright pink. Yes. Go to JodyBunting.com. First thing you see is you in a in a in a pink spandex outfit. <laughs> 
<laughs> you can't be, you know, it just gets people's attention. And again, being overweight, that's what they used to put me in. Yeah. Oh, we've got you another pink t shirt. Let's Jojo. really make you stand out. I remember one of the times when I was on the underground, I was like, please don't let me wear pink today because I've got to travel in public again. When, when did you, I mean, we say, oh, you lost half your body weight, which is what, you know, 15, 16 stones, something like that? Yes. So when I was at my heaviest 31 stone, I actually lost 10 stone in a year uh, because I started to exercise quite a lot. So initially the loss was huge and it was fast. Was that a, a, a point in your life when you made a concerted decision? Right, no more of this. and I, I, I don't want to be this shape. Yes. So again, like I said about my Alistry class, that was kind of a bit of a turning point. I just split up, split up with my partner then. Um, so as as you do when you have a breakup, you kind of motivation, right? I'm joining the gym. I'm going to eat. Yes, that's it. So it was kind of that and my fitness classes starting at the same time. That was the real recipe for success for me and really motivated me to change. We should say there's a whole nother dimension really to that. I, I don't want to dwell on bad things in people's lives, but you talk about a breakup. The, the thing there is that you now happily talk about the fact that actually you, you I, don't, I don't want to say that you regret because you've got a little girl out of this. Yes. But so regret is probably far too strong, but you, you wish you'd been more honest, what, with yourself about your sexuality sooner? Yeah, when I was, I think I knew I was gay when I was about 13. Um, and kind of uh, fell for this girl at college and ended up uh, living with her uh, and really fell in love with her. You know, at the time, I really did adore her and we tried where we were we were not living together and I knew from that moment I did want to be with her. Um, but when uh, Phoebe, my daughter, was born, we decided to give her um, my partner's second name and not my second name because something inside, you know, we knew that we weren't going to be together forever. So, like I said, that was kind of my... Because, you know, everybody wants the 2.4 children. You know, you want the perfect life, your children to have a mum and dad, and kind of it's quite traditional family-wise. So that's why I put that in that kind of regret section, because, you know, I wish I could have given my daughter the perfect start with 2.4 and, you know, the perfect mum and dad living with her. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm the luckiest gay man alive because I know so many that are desperate for children and just to have some sort of family connection. So I really am lucky to have my wonderful daughter. And a daughter. good relationship with her. She's a fitness instructor herself now, isn't she? Yes, so she's just started as a personal trainer at Everlast on Pride Park in Derby. And... She used to work for Weight Watchers, like I used to work for Weight Watchers as well. And mum actually works for uh, Weight Watchers as well. So that's kind of the, the, the tale she's gone down. She's had a th few health issues herself, which, led, which has led her to actually find out more about diet and fitness. So that's kind of why she's followed us in our footsteps. Uh, she's just become a vegan as well. Have you got vegan children or not? No, I did, vegan, it just feels like such a commitment, veganism. I, I get a lot of the arguments. I'm, I'm heart, part sold on some of them, but it looks like hard work. It, to be honest, my personal opinion is it's quite expensive to buy, you know, non-commercial yeah. foods. Um, and again, you have to look at the quality of the food, of the vegetables and stuff like that. It's just so hard to balance your fats and your proteins when you're a vegan. But good on her. She's doing it for ethical reasons. She's watched all those documentaries online and she did uh, V January. And from there, uh, this January gone. And from there, she's just been vegan all the time. So. But again, I'm proud of her because she's yeah. doing, she's trying not to go for the processed vegan food. She's not trying to go for the fake meats and stuff like that. So she's doing pretty well as being a vegan. So get you the proud dad. Yes. Again, you know, when I last saw you 20 something years ago, none of that was a thing. Um, you mentioned Weight Watchers there. Let's get all the uncomfortable stuff out of the way. Maybe it's not uncomfortable for you, but when you left Weight Watchers, it was in... Uh, Difficult circumstances. You had some mental health problems, didn't you? Yes. Now, this was kind of an eye-opener for me because I'd never... I've got lots of clients that have got mental health issues and I, I have empathy for them and I kind of understand, but I never have a deep, deep understanding that I've gone through it myself, and which is why I love... Uh, coaching weight loss clients because I know what it's like to be 31 stone you know I can really get in their shoes but with mental health it was a bit of an odd one for me and then with Weight Watchers I was w working all around Derby um, and I'd gone to an Ariana Grande concert in Sheffield uh, had a little bit too much to drink um, 
And the next day I woke up and I was kind of, um, you know, this, this COVID term brain fog. Yeah. I had brain fog. I didn't know what it was, but I just didn't feel right. And for the next two weeks, I drove my car, I went to work and I did all the normal things, but I still had this brain fog. Um, I went to the doctor, said, you know, I don't know what's wrong with me. Um, I just can't concentrate. I feel like I'm not really here or, you know, it was like I was in some sort of dream. And one afternoon I went to my Weight Watchers class and I, I have to actually laugh about it now, but looking back, you know, I did feel sorry for my Weight Watchers clients because I just started to joke around with them. And there was at one point where I got a lady's uh, kitten heel shoes I got her to swap with my shoes, her shoes. And I was walking around this Weight Watchers class in kitten heels. You know, to look back now, it was like, and thankfully, because they, Weight Watchers attract like quite a lot of nurses and stuff like that, people knew there wasn't something, something right. Wonder, right. I'm not the sort of person to go into work drunk. You know, there was, there was something wrong with me. So thankfully, one of my co colleagues took me to A&E uh, in Derby Royal. And from there, they were kind of a little bit confused. They didn't really know what was happening. Um, and I was grabbing the doctors. Uh, this is what my mum, because they called my mum at this point, And I was telling them that I love them. It was really, but I was going for the guy. And you can remember it, but it's, it's sort of Yeah, it's just a day. So I'm going up to these doctors. I remember not, when they told me to wait in A&E, I just barged through the A&E doors and I was just going up to a male doctor and saying, I love you. Not in a, um, you know, like an attack sort of way, mm. but it was still uncomfortable for them. So in the end, they called the police and I got arrested. Wow. So again, it got really serious really quickly. So from this person joking around in kitten heels, it, I was suddenly arrested in, um, in jail. Um, and it was quite strange for me because I've not experienced the law or anything like that. Um, I slept it off the night. The next day I woke up and I was fine. Um, and kind of, they just released me with a caution and that was that. The mental health spoke with me then and they said, I've got no mental health issues. So I'd gone through this really extreme stage of being admitted to A&E, getting arrested. And then suddenly... And no one can give you any reason for no, it. No, any I justification. any answers. No. So I went back to the GP. I've got a really good GP who kind of understands that I've got diabetes type 2. And in the end, he said, he thought the alcohol two weeks ago had sent my blood sugars like kind of crazy. Um, and what had happened has, I had something called DDD. What's that which stand for, It's uh, derealisation depersonalization disorder. Ooh. So it's a short term mental health uh, experience or condition uh, that can people, some people can get it once and never have it again. Other people's it's a recurring factor. Has it ever come back for you? No, thankfully this has never happened again. And um, it was, again, he said it was brought on by the diabetes. I'm a diabetic type two. Um, and it was brought on by the alcohol that had obviously sent my um, blood sugars crashing up and down. And after about a week, I had some extra metformin and I was completely fine and it never happened again. What a scary episode though. So sadly, I got sacked from Weight Watchers because obviously I'd caused quite a commotion it, in it, the it, class. Yeah, and, I mean, it was pretty widely reported as well because, of course, you've made a bit of a name for yourself. So quite but, the kerfuffle. But thankfully for me, you know, I've got a lot of... Uh, I had a lot of clients in Weight Watchers and people that know me outside Weight Watchers as well. And I launched my own coaching business again. Um, and since that day, I've never looked back. You know, people, my clients are so supportive. Um, and I also think business wise, because I've had an experience with mental health and so many people have got mental health issues these days. I actually think it's done great for business. You know, people come to me and talk about this story and share what they've gone through. So actually, it's been a win win for me. Absolutely. Hey, let's play another song. Take a break. Talk some more. Jody Bunting. Well, if you're counting, it's uh, just gone 20 to 1 on a Tuesday afternoon doing lunch with Jody Bunting of jodybunting.com, of the big breakfast back in the day, and Trisha, and lots of TV. Actually, Jody Bunting's not technically your name anymore, is it? No. So in 2010, I changed my official name to Joseph Spenlove. 
Uh, the reason being, I think a lot of people that get um, a certain level of success, they get they get to the top of their mountain and they fall either one way or the other. One of those ways is drinks and drugs and destroy themselves. And the other way is religion. Um, and I kind of um, got to a stage in my life where I wanted you know, is this it? I want, you know, I want something more. I was expecting, you know, a successful a life purpose. to be some, yeah, a purpose. I think that's probably a good word to use. So I started to um, explore religion. I went to the Etwal Tara Center, the meditation center to learn a bit about Buddhism. Um, and then I also went to um, uh, Egypt and my Christian friends introduced me to the church. Uh, I also went to a mosque and prayed like a Muslim for two weeks. Um, and from going through this journey, I decided I want to be a Christian. I came back to Derby and I did the Alpha course um, and I was confirmed in Derby Cathedral. And part of that was to um, have this new beginning. So a part of that, um, in college, I was put into a girl's dormitory because they thought it was a girl because of my name. So the, the, the church leaders agreed that I was probably better changing my name for my new beginning. So I became Joseph Spenlove. Uh, Joseph because it's the longer version of Jody basically and Spenlove is my mother's maiden name. Um, so from then is when I legally, I'm now known as Joseph Spenlove. Um, Professionally you're still Jody Bunting so that's a bit of a I like to think existence, it, isn't it? it's a bit like a stage name. I think that's yeah. probably the easiest, just because a lot of people... I mean, to be fair, I do exactly the same thing I've got to, so I know where, you, where you're coming from. But it kind of just works for everything. Yeah. Um, anyway, that was a tangent. Um, you speak Arabic. You mentioned Egypt there. You spent a long time working in Egypt. How did that come about? So when I'd lost my, my weight and I moved down to London... Again, I was kind of disappointed with London. Is this it? Is this the all life has to offer? So I started looking for jobs abroad um, and ended up working, got a job in Egypt. So I went out of there for six months. Um, it was amazing. It was like a really luxurious five-star hotel uh, in Haggadah. Uh, I renewed my contract, stayed for another six months and then set on my own entertainment, energy, uh, entertainment mm -hmm. agency. Uh, they call it animation over there. I don't know if you've heard that term. But we were all animators and I was uh, bringing people over from the UK to work in hotels. And I just loved it there because I made lots of Egyptian friends, went to their houses, you know, I went to Luxor, these really poor villages. And one of the things I noticed was there was no cancer, there was no obesity, you know, the, these kind of health issues which are normal in the UK, there was none of that there. And I just found it intriguing how, you know, what are these people doing that we're not doing? And that was the fact that they were living off the land. You know, they were growing vegetables and fruit in their garden. They were eating fresh milk from their, their cow or their neighbor's cow. And they were active. You know, there was, there was no delivery service for food and stuff like that. So they had to walk miles to go to their field that they'd been uh, attending to all summer. Or they'd have to go to uh, town to do to go to the bank, for instance. So it was kind of that whole lifestyle. And the other thing that I found strange was they were happy. You know, they had next to nothing. Uh, they lived in what some people would call a cow shed. You know, it was it was really basic. But these people were sitting in the street in the evening drinking uh, tea and just they were happy people. And not measuring happiness by material acquisition. Exactly, yeah. So it was that, that was the real reason that I loved Egypt and I ended up staying on and off for 10 years. I should say you also fronted a thing called Sham's Got Talent while you were there. This was fun. So while I was in Sham El Sheikh, They've got like, a, basically like the shopping centre area. And it was the time where Got Talent shows were, were popping up everywhere. And they decided to do Shom's Got Talent. And I was the presenter on this stage show. And it was just fantastic. We had people, tri they had a 10,000 Egyptian pound, which is only a thousand um, quid. But people were travelling from Cairo to be in that show because they wanted to win the money. Doing some weird acts. Yeah, there was, I remember a, um, you know what the, what's it called? A, I'd love to try and explain what you're doing with your wrist in the air. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, a ventriloquist. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. That, like a puppeteer thing. Okay. Like an old man with a puppet. I remember that being yeah. one of the worst acts. 
Um, and then we actually had some amazing singers, one who's currently one of the, the he's like basically in the top 10 charts in Egypt right, right now. Good. So Done well from it. Yeah. we discovered some great talent over there. Uh, and again, it was just fun to do that sort of show. And it was a good test for my Arabic. So I had to learn quite a lot of Arabic for that. Um, but yeah, it was fun in Egypt. You never knowingly shy away from the limelight, do you? Me, Ian? Like, shy away? <laughs> last, last year you were in the papers again. You got this gig testing Easter eggs for Aldi. Oh, this was heaven. Right, I, I told my slimmers, let's all enter this competition that Aldi are doing because yeah. you can basically test all their new selection of Easter eggs. I think they were joking. I think they thought I was joking, but I actually applied and I won the gig. So I got these uh, 10 Easter eggs sent to me from Aldi and all I had to do was just make a video reviewing them all. It was basically my dream job. Um, and it was just fantastic. It ended up getting into the, the press as well. And I did a photo shoot where Aldi had to send me another 10 eggs oh, just to use as props for the photos. <laughs> Where have you met the king? <clears throat> One of my friends been working for the Prince's Trust. Um, when it was the Trin Prince's Trust birthday a few uh, years ago, they had a garden party to celebrate. Uh, and I went down to London. And again, I put that as one of the, the my greatest achievements because it was just, I was speechless at that moment. Uh, it's, it's exactly how you think, you know, they've got the delicate little cakes from yeah. Waitrose there and everything's, it's just exactly how you imagine. And I wore a white suit, again, just trying to be discreet, Ian, uh, with a gold tie. And King Charles said to me, oh, what a delightful suit. <laughs> <laughs> so that is my claim to fame. That's the, nice. king, the king says my white suit was delightful. These are good memories to hold on to, aren't they? Um, we're nearly out of time. We should tell people what you're up to now, which which we, we won't be quick. Um, you've got a book you're working on. What's that? Life story? What is it? Yeah, so it's a, an autobiography, kind of giving out health advice as well, because I've tried lots of different diets and fitness and lifestyle. So it's kind of my journey through life, but also giving out lots of uh, helpful health advice. You've got a podcast, the Jody yes. Bunting podcast. Uh, I've just launched this actually a few weeks ago. We've had uh, my friend Sue talking about menopause and I've got some other fitness people coming on as well. Uh, even my daughter, she's doing one for veganism as well in January. So Brilliant. I'm just going through kind of all those subjects in depth that my mm -hmm. slimmers want to know more about. In the meantime, you still do the, the online weight loss courses, which yes. are free. Yes, so I do free classes. Uh, it's a basically a 14-day free course, just so people can see what I'm about, help them lose a stone in 14 days, and if they want to sign up, they can. But also, I know at 31 stone, if I had to pay for a personal trainer, I wouldn't have done it. You know, if somebody offers me a free course, maybe I would have done it. So if I can get to really overweight people and help them, like... I wish somebody had helped me at that time, then it's good. You do countless other things, the aqua fitness and the, the dance fit, and it's all on jodybunting.com, I guess. But what's, what's your favourite moment in the week? My favourite, you know what? It's teaching aqua in Burton. Don't ask me why, but just the Burton people, I love to sing along to the music, and it's just the funnest time of my whole week. I can turn the music up and just sing along with them totally over time here but it's so good to see you again thank you for coming in jody my pleasure thank you for bringing healthy lunch for me as well uh jody bunting is my guest for lunch this afternoon thank you jody <laughs>